One of the hardest parts about being a vampire is that it imposes certain limitations. How are you supposed to bend the world to your whim when you're only able to operate eight hours out of every day? That is where the ghouls come in. Today, we're going to be discussing the physiology, psychology, and societal structure of these nearly immortal servants. Disclaimer, the following information largely comes from Ghoul's Fatal Addiction, which was released alongside 2nd edition, and Ghoul's Invevenance, which released alongside 4th edition. As such, some of this information might be retconned if and when they release sourcebooks on Ghoul's for the newest edition. Once that happens, I'll be sure to release an addendum and link it in the iCard right here. Also, mild to moderate trigger warning for drug abuse, cannibalism, slavery, and abusive relationships. You have been warned. Ghouls have been around ever since the first edition of Vampire the Masquerade, and have remained pretty consistent since then. Ghouls are mortals who, after being fed vampire blood, are granted supernatural powers in exchange for being mystically bound to their master, or domitor, as the official term goes. While they technically count as a masquerade violation, there are after all very few mortals who will not demand an immediate explanation upon being fed someone's blood and being granted supernatural powers, ghouls are still incredibly common among the kindred of the Camarilla. Most of the research into the effects of ghouling has been carried out by Dr. Douglas Netchurch, a Malkavian scientist of the Camarilla, alongside his child Dr. Nancy Rieg, PhD. His research was very thorough and gives us some incredible insight into what exactly happens to someone who has been ghouled. First and foremost, there's their powers. Ghouls are able to call upon their vampiric blood to enhance their physical capabilities and speed up their body's natural healing processes, even being able to regrow limbs given enough blood. Ghouls are also able to learn disciplines, though they're more disposed to some than others. Physical disciplines like celerity, fortitude, and potence are the easiest for them to learn, while clan-specific powers like protean and especially blood sorcery prove more difficult. Even without the elders of these clans closely watching who has these powers. In addition, they may only learn disciplines that their domitor already knows. In one of Dr. Netchurch's many experiments, he had three ghouls attempt to learn Protean. One had been ghouled by a gangrel, another by himself, he had been gifted Protean prior to the experiment, and the third by Toriador, who did not know Protean. The gangrel's ghoul was the first to succeed, with his own ghoul taking nearly double that time, and the Toriador ghoul not being able to learn Protean at all. While ghouls aren't generally affected by things like frenzy, they do begin to take on some of their Domitor's clan curse. A Bruja ghoul might be more quick to lash out at friends or loved ones, a Ministry ghoul might become more sensitive to light, and a Nosferatu ghoul, why not decaying into a full-on corpse, begins to look a little pale, their eyes a little more sunken into their heads. Cooling also has a number of psychological side effects. Vampire blood is one of the most addictive drugs on the planet, and that addiction, even more so than the blood bond, is what keeps a mortal going back to their domitor. And, much like an addict, ghouls who are not fed tend to suffer from intense withdrawal. Ghouls going through withdrawal will often seek other things to satisfy their appetites. Everything from other actual drugs to engaging in cannibalism, consuming human flesh and blood in an attempt to sate their hunger. The flip side of withdrawal is overfeeding, which is incredibly rare, only happening when a ghoul fills her veins and her stomach with vampire blood. This overdose has a couple of side effects. The subject begins experiencing a vampire-esque frenzy. Their bodily fluids reek of blood and even contain specks of blood, and they begin to suffer from hallucinations 
as their blood becomes oxygenated. In some very extreme cases, they begin to suffer something similar to diver's disease, experiencing intense pain and even paralysis. In such case, ghouls who lack the presence of mind to spend blood on boosting their strength are bound for the grave. While ghouls are not immune to disease, nor do they lose the need for food or water, they do stop aging so long as they are fed. But note the wording there, so long as they are fed. Should a ghoul's domitor stop supplying them with vitae, they revert to a normal human, losing all their disciplines in the process. In addition, while younger ghouls simply experience the aforementioned withdrawal, ghouls who have lived for more than a hundred years suddenly begin aging ten times faster than a normal human, while ghouls over the age of 250 simply crumble to dust upon having their supply cut short. There's also the effects that ghouling has on childbirth, and this contains some gross pregnancy talk, so if you're squeamish about that sort of thing, skip ahead to this timecode. See, cooling a pregnant person has a profound effect on the fetus, namely it stops the fetus from aging and coming to term. So if you want the baby to actually come out, you need to take the person carrying it off their blood supply, which as previously mentioned, is potentially dangerous if that person has been a ghoul for more than a hundred years. But if the baby and the person carrying it manage to survive, you have a child who can produce its own supply of vitae at the cost of being susceptible to vampiric frenzy. These, at least in the Sabbat, are called revenants. And they'll get their own video some other day. Sorry, but this video is long enough as it is right now. Now, if you are experienced with any of the other massive World of Darkness spin-offs, you might be asking, the World of Darkness is full of all sorts of creatures. Why haven't vampires tried to ghoul any of them? Well, they have. Attempts by our good friend Dr. Netshirts to ghoul werewolves resulted in the werewolves simply vomiting the blood back up, which makes sense since Vampires are one of the creatures that werewolves were supposedly created to combat. Mages have been ghouled before, with basically the same effect as ghouling an ordinary human. Some Giovanni and Samdi have even tried to ghoul ghosts, but to no avail since even when ghosts manifest in physical form, they're not being kept alive by traditional biology. As for creatures like mummies, demons, and fae, well, most vampires don't even believe that such creatures exist, so who knows what would happen there. So, what are ghouls used for? Well, it varies from clan to clan, and from generation to generation. Bruja and Toreador are rather flippant with who they ghoul, creating entire social circles subservient to their whims. Alcavrians and Zemisi also ghoul frequently, but it's less about having friends or servants, and more about creating guinea pigs, with the fortitude to survive the horrific mental and physical experiments that they are put through. Many clans, like the Tremere, Banu Hakim, and Ministry, entice schools with the promise of the embrace, so long as they serve their masters faithfully. And still other clans, like La Sombra and Gangrel, have little patience for humans in general, and see little use for ghouls. Quite fittingly, most vampires view ghouls as somewhere between kindred and human in terms of respect. While ghouls are human, and thus inherently inferior to vampires, they are trusted to uphold the masquerade, as well as with whatever duties their master have them perform, so a smart kindred won't just treat her ghoul like dirt. Spoiling them, however, is often equally destructive to their working relationship, so kindred must pick and choose when they reward their servants very carefully. But what about those rare ghouls who don't have masters? Those dangerous individuals who are desperate enough and clever enough to slake their hunger on multiple kindred. These independent ghouls make for some of the most compelling antagonists in the world of darkness, as while not as physically powerful as vampires, 
They obviously have the cunning to either make themselves useful to them or overpower them long enough to feed. Take Caiaphas Smith, for example, a hardcore Puritan and head sorcerer who, through consuming the blood of his enemies, has continued hunting vampires for nearly 200 years despite being a mortal. Or the Sanguinaries, an organization of independent ghouls who trade vampire blood for favors throughout the United States and Canada. Or even the Disciples of Set, a group of gay Egyptian bikers who destroyed a ministry temple and appointed themselves the true prophets of Set. And no, I'm not making that up. But these factions are rare and, in all honesty, not even that independent. One ghoul cult, the Sacrament of the Reborn, have gone so far as to worship vampires as literal gods. These are all ghouls that have been abandoned by their masters and literally pray nightly for the new messianic domitor to appear one day and provide them with their fix for all eternity. But of course, it's all a con run by ministry ghouls seeking to bind hundreds of mortals to his masters and prove himself worthy of the embrace. No matter how independent they may claim to be, all ghouls are slaves. If not to masters, then to blood. And that, at least, they have in common with the kindred. Thank you all so much for watching this video, I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what other topics on tabletop RPGs I should cover in the description below. As always, if you like this video, please do not forget that there is a button for that, and please be sure to subscribe if you want to see more content from me. I discuss tabletop RPGs, occasionally do let's plays, and do storytelling videos. If you want to support me in a more direct fashion, I have a Patreon, where you can sign up to help me write scripts, join a Patreon-exclusive Discord, and get access to behind-the-scenes footage. But of course, none of that is strictly necessary. Liking the videos, commenting on them, and sharing them with your friends are always great ways to support me. As always, my name is Lily, and Trans Rights.